so what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to a tournament. Oh, what kind of a tournament? I'm like, it's a video game tournament. You make money playing video games? Welcome to Exploring Esports, where we deep dive into the fastest growing sports industry. What does it take to make it? How do gamers deal with newfound fame? And most importantly, how do they stay on top in this fiercely competitive world? All these answers, here. Today, we're taking a look at how the esports industry grew. Up first, how do gamers make money? And how much money do they make? Hi, my name is Doug Sensor Martin. I'm a competitive Call of Duty player and a FaZe Clan content creator. Sensor has been in the competitive esports scene since 2011 and has won over a quarter of a million dollars playing Call of Duty. He's also a member of FaZe Clan, which is one of the most popular esports organizations in the world. So Call of Duty, that was the game that you became professional in. When did you go from it being kind of a passion to your profession? When we were growing up as kids, this wasn't a career path. I even won the national championship, which was the most money you can make in a tournament at the time. And I didn't even think it was going to be a career. I stopped playing and I went to college. But clearly, you're back at it again. What happened? I saw Call of Duty announcing million dollar tournaments and, and I was like, wow. I told my mom, I was like, listen, I'm going to stop going to college for this next year. I'm going to focus all on video games. I'm going to try to make this a career. I just felt like I could win and I felt like I had a good message that I could share to people. You've been playing since 09 and 10. How, are they, like, what, how do you see it changing? How do you see like, a the lot better. It's yeah. a lot better now. I mean, first of all, that even four years ago, when I was winning championships, I wasn't making a salary. Now right. these guys are making $100,000 a year in salary. There's so much more money to be made in these tournaments. There's so many more people watching it. There's actual career paths that can be taken in streaming, uh, YouTube gaming. I make YouTube videos, I live stream. I went from competitive player to a YouTuber, back to a competitive player, back to a YouTuber. I was in Sharknado. I don't even know what the hell I am anymore, man. You were in Sharknado? I was the helicopter pilot in Sharknado. <laughs> Stop it. That's me! That's me right there! That's my face! So you've been in this industry already for a decade. What about the next decade? If yeah. something's not broken, why would I want to fix it? I love Fair my enough. life. I, I have my two beautiful dogs. Family lives right next to me. I live in the area that I love. I've traveled in so many places because of this, this job. Competitive gaming is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time, a lot of preparation, a lot of sacrifice, and it's one of the best feelings when you can win. The big business of video games. 14-year-old Griffin Spakovsky, known by his gaming moniker Skeptic, earned $200,000 playing the video game Fortnite. Skeptic is a 14-year-old Fortnite player who is already making huge waves in the esports community. I qualified for the World Cup, so I get to go to New York City and compete there for uh, $30 million. Dude! Oh my gosh, I think I just broke my desk, dude. Oh Sundown my message gosh, you. Sundown messaged me and said I just, we just qualified. Do you know what the prize pool is for the World Cup? It's $15 million for duos, $15 million for solos. 30 million. I know that they said that they were going to invest $100 million into their first year of esports, but it's just crazy to think $30 million in one tournament where Dota is at $25 million. Yeah. And Dota's been around for a decade. Oh, yeah. Here comes Fortnite saying, nope, $100 million. That's what we're going to invest into it. How do you think that's impacting the game? A lot more people are playing, I think, because they want to win this money. I think the competitive players get more excited and a lot more like competitive grind is into it. Do you have any concerns going into the World Cup? Kind of nervous because like there's a lot of other top tier players. Yeah. So it's definitely going to be a challenge. Over the last course of a year, I've made upwards of around $300,000 over playing Fortnite. Not only do I make money from competing, I also make money through streaming on Twitch, Caffeine, and making YouTube videos daily. Hey guys, it's Jeff. There are a million reasons to go pro or go into a career in esports, but of course, number one is uh, money. There's so much advertising, dollars being funneled into esports, that 13 to 21 age group, that is the impressionable generation. Brands are throwing their money there. Kids can grow up knowing that they can make money playing these video games. That is how the pros are getting paid. Of course, streaming is an incredible option. They can just start on their own with platforms like Twitch, and it's not easy, but there is that ability to believe that without being a pro, you can make a living. Players Lounge is a platform that lets gamers from all around the world challenge each other for cash prizes. So you don't need to be a pro to make money from all of your favorite games. The idea behind the platform is that we can offer esports competitions to anyone in the world from the comfort of their own home. Even if you're playing a $10 Madden game or a $50 or $100 Madden game, the money's important, but what's really there is like the rush, how alive it feels to play and be in last zone with like a dollar on the line. But I would say the average uh, gamer on Players Lounge is uh, paying like a $10 entry fee and winning like around $20 at a time. So here we have the matchmaking area. You can either play in a $1 room, $5 room, 
or a free room. And what are the things here? We have a, a chat for people to communicate together. Correct. So this is where people can find opponents to play custom games against. And in a custom game, you can send a challenge to somebody for anywhere between $5 or $500. I think what the Players Lounge is doing for the community is really cool. There's a lot of players out there that can't travel to these, uh, not even international events, but to just local tournaments because they have full-time jobs or maybe they have families to take care of. So the fact that there's this place online where they can hone their skills, have a community to play with, and also earn some money is really cool. Gaming can make you millions. But as we saw from Sensor and Skeptic, you have to put in the work. After the break, we come back and answer the age-old question, is gaming a real sport? And we're back. Despite being around for years, esports still struggle to get recognition as real sports. They are considered professional athletes. And now I've watched. This is, my this sons are diehard video game players. Probably parents is going to shock they parents, but the ship They can't the jump, they can't do nothing. <laughs> this is good news. This is good news. <laughs> From like an endurance perspective, absolutely a sport. If you can say like chess is a sport or something like that, you're, it's all thinking, you know what I mean? You're just trying to outthink your opponent. It's at a high enough level where I would say, all right, if you think that this is so easy, then do it. As a traditional sports enthusiast, I'm gonna go ahead and say that esports is not a sport. Hey everyone, this is Giuseppe Guastella, AKA The Godfather. I am the eSports FIFA player for the LA Galaxy and represent the US Soccer Federation. Here from the Godfather, Ibrahimovic able to find Messi out wide. Piani! Oh. There it is! There it is! 1 0 for the Godfather! What are some things that preparing for an esports tournament or even just becoming a pro player that people that aren't gamers would think of? You have to know like the ins and outs of the game, the actual like physics and how the players move. You actually have to know which player to use at a certain position, when to move up your attacking. You have to understand soccer. So when did sports franchises start becoming invested into esports? So the MLS wanted to start an actual league called the EMLS which brought these clubs, like the Galaxy, to have a one representative to represent the club. And I'm one of the top players in the United States. I'm based in LA, so it was a perfect fit for the Galaxy and I to join the EMLS. You know, we have this really interesting juxtaposition of gaming and esports. Do you think esports is a real sport? I'm gonna be the bad guy on this. I don't think esports is a sport. I could be 50 years old, and I could be one of the best players in the world. For me, it's sitting down in a chair mm -hmm. and moving your fingers. Mentally, it's there, but for it to be a sport, it has to be physically and mentally there. Esport, sport, it, it doesn't matter. The, the generation now, instead of watching sports, they're watching these tournaments, they're watching us play. It doesn't matter if it's called an actual sport, esports is fine. It, it takes as much mus muscle memory or muscles, period, as much as any other sport. And just like regular sports, you have strategies, you tell one person to go one direction, you tell the other guy to hold down this other guy. But if you have an audience, and you have people who, for whatever they're doing, stop what they're doing in the middle of their day to look at a screen, that's a sport. Who cares? Why do, do we have to have that debate again? It is just people coming together and having fun, and as long as it's making people happy, who cares if it's a sport? Hey guys, it's Jeff. A lot of people are asking, is eSports a sport? Well, think about it. It includes hand-eye coordination, body preparation, and it is a competition. We consider shooting a sport, curling, NASCAR. What's the difference, really, between pushing a pedal and using the controller? Now, there's another side to this question. Does eSports care about being a sport? And I actually don't think so. You look at the college level. Frankly, collegiate esports have a chance to correct wrongs made by the NCAA and create their own vertical on college campuses. On college campuses, there's a discussion now between the athletic departments and the esports clubs of how to make this. Should we make this a sport? I don't think you need to be the most athletic person, but I do believe it is a sport because of the mental capacity that's necessary at that point. I think what most people don't recognize who aren't in esports is that it's not like, oh, a bunch of guys just playing video games. 
yeah, your thumbs really have to move fast, but your brain has to oh, move just as quick yeah. because every times. single person knows every single thing about the game. I'm a big golfer, but what's different than golf, really? With esports, I mean, when you think about what you're doing with your hands, mm -hmm. with your brain. If you consider chess to be a sport or poker to be a sport, then esports is 100% one. Also, we get really sweaty, or I get really sweaty. Oh. Maybe I can't speak for you, but I get a little sweaty when I'm playing competitively. Yeah. Well, trust me, I interview some of these NBA 2K League guys after games. They're soaked in sweat. <laughs> That's the other thing. Like, it's a gladiator sport, so you have to earn every single thing that you get. It's not like you can be the 12th best man in the NBA on a team and you're gonna get a championship ring and you have a guaranteed salary. You right. can make zero dollars and play the entire year competitively. It depends on your success. So that mindset is entirely different when you have one of the best players across from you and you're thinking like, I gotta kill for my food here. I think esports could actually end up being just as big as any other sport. First off, the target demographic is younger. Kids want to go to see the Giants or the Jets or anyone like that, of course, but they yeah. don't get to see Tom Brady as often as they could see anyone on YouTube or yeah. Twitch. That connection that they would have to that professional is just incredible. It's growing so rapidly. I mean, honestly, the sky is the limit for where these things can actually go. Well, something that a lot of players don't know, or a lot of fans don't know about in esports is that they have coaches. It's incredible. Yeah. They know all the players. They have everything locked down. They've also watched hours and hours of game film, film on the yeah. team that they're playing. People Tell someone it's not a sport at that point. The world may never agree on if esports are a real sport, but you can't deny their competitive spirit. More on what it's like at an esports tournament after this. What does it take to organize and run an esports tournament? Let's find out. My name is Danny Harvath. I am Director of Business Development at Nerd Street Gamers. It's an eSports facility right here in Northern Liberties, Philly. We're here for a national championship series, $2,500 up for grabs. We're all about providing competitive opportunities and eSports facilities, venues for the amateur competitor. Kids see the pro leagues going on and want to know how do they get to that point? Where do they go to compete? We provide that avenue for amateur growth. This tournament right now is being broadcast live on Twitch. In terms of the operations of the event and the broadcast, there's a lot of production going on in the back room right now. Talent that includes casters and analysts. There's also tournament admins directing the event and helping guide teams through the brackets. There's a lot going on. My name is Griffin Landisberg. I am a technical director here at Nerd Street Gamers. That means I produce the broadcasts and the streams for all of the tournaments and events that we run. For every broadcast, this, this standard pieces that need to go into it. You have to have commentators, you have to have lights, camera. You have the observer, which is essentially the in-game cameraman. Higher level productions, we might have a team of four to five observers that are all in the same game, capturing different camera angles in case we want to pull like a certain replay or a certain angle that we didn't capture beforehand. Counter-Strike's a very fast-paced game, so when a crazy clip happens, you need to be able to say, all right, let's bring that in and then replay it for the stream within 10 seconds. I'm Mike Darf, Mike Winnick. I'm a Counter-Strike caster, so I do commentary for matches, tournaments like this. If you're passionate about esports, one of the important things you can do is find your niche. It's a medium that really suits me and what I love to do, which is just being able to share things that I'm passionate about and excited about and really tell a story and help to build that narrative for people. People don't understand that people enjoy watching other people play video games. When you see the intensity of the players competing and the energy around it, that's what it takes a lot of times for people to really get it. Hey everyone, Kelly Link here and I am at Thunder Smash. It is a Smash Brothers tournament run by Thunder Gaming. I mean, you can feel the intensity going on right now. There's a lot of hype from the audience, but the most intense part about this event is that it is winner takes all $20,000 only going to one person. I started running tournaments when I was 15 years old. I was a kid with a clipboard and his mom's laptop at his mom's house running house tournaments. I didn't go into the scene and say to myself, oh yeah, I'm gonna become a commentator. I did lifestyle talk shows, and I was a weather guy for a while. I did sports. I talked to the director of uh, eSports to say, hey, I would love to do some live broadcast work, and he gave me a chance. And then from there, I've gotten to work great events like CEO, Evo for the last couple years, and have been just trying to grow from that. I had an opportunity to cover the League of Legends World Championships for ESPN. So after that, I said, you know, now that I realize that this is something that I can pursue, uh, I want this to be what I go after. I actually didn't know the competitive scene existed until roughly 2015 um, when I had met a classmate of mine with a Smash shirt on. They are like, yeah, I just came back from Apex. And I was like, Apex, what is that? Back in 2016, the dawning of that grassroots Smash Brothers community that everybody knows started when I was a freshman in college. We were all just teenagers playing Smash Brothers because we enjoyed playing Smash Brothers. And then money got involved and we realized that this could be 
something really cool. For someone like myself, the prospect of being able to cast events, like we're here at Thunder Smash, right? And this has the biggest first place prize in Smash history, which is unbelievable. I love to sit at a desk with people who are experts of the game and get the best conversation possible. If you have monitors and you have switches, the entire Smash community can already offer their talent. There's people who've been running tournaments for decades already in the scene, content producers, commentators, or casters, doing all the things that you would think you would need to find people or train people, you don't have to. You just need to have people who are passionate enough, and guess what, they're everywhere here. Hey guys, it's Jeff. There's a big difference between competing on your couch and actually competing at a tournament or event. You have people from all over the world who maybe aren't playing just show up because they want that energy of being in the same place watching the best in the world compete on the same screen. There is a crowd and yes, they do influence the competition. If you hear the crowd howl behind you, you're going to react. It's something that you will never get in person on your couch just with your friends. These are strangers, people you don't know cheering for you or against you. It is a legitimate component of the game. No doubt, tournament play is different than playing with your friends at home. After the break, we get an inside look at the esports community. We've seen how the pros and tournaments work, but what about the fans and amateurs? Let's check out the gaming community. Video games, one of the most amazing aspects of it is that you can play with people all around the world, internationally, in, in Australia, in Asia, anywhere. And they can, you can make friends with people that you would have never had the opportunity to really get to know or hang out with outside of that. And I feel like it kind of has changed the dynamic of this open internet world where players tend to stay online. Uh, my name is Luigino Gigante. I'm the owner of Waypoint Cafe, which is New York's first premier esports cafe located here in Manhattan. Um, for the community here, we've kind of built a community here. Um, after a lot of the old arcades like Chinatown Fair went away, there were there was no spot for gamers to come. So when we opened, we get a lot of people who do come every day to play games. Um, they also play with their friends. We also get a lot of groups and a lot of uh, people just coming by just to hang out. I see gaming going more as a more social aspect, honestly, um, as more people get into gaming, regardless of what platform or what type of game they play. Um, same thing with esports, I see more and more people just getting ready just to go into it. Uh, video games is not exclusive, you know, anyone can game, any age, any race. I really feel like people believe that games in general are considered a lazy concept, that you just lay back create your own little world and then tie, and cut off ties from the actual world. I believe that it's actually the opposite. You're joining these groups, you're playing with your friends, maybe even family members, and you're having all a good time. Growing up as a gamer in the late 90s and early 2000s, you kind of were hindered a little bit by what internet you had. But one of the opportunities for you and your friends to play together uninhibited was the LAN centers. LAN centers were a huge deal, an opportunity for you and your friends to get together and play any of the games that you wanted to play. Well, the internet has gone better over the last two decades, but LAN centers are still around, and you gotta give credit to the community. Hi hey everyone, Kelly Link here with Ray from Local Battles, a land center in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Now Ray, I gotta ask you, how did this whole place start? What was the conception of the idea? I wasn't here when it began. I actually live next door, but um, yeah, I guess that goes to shows because it was something to bring the community together. Yeah. Um, it's something that you know people like to do, people like the game. Um, and I think people come to places like this because they, they want to play together. There's always that, that want to be, you know, social, uh, be around your friends while you're playing games. So that's, that's exactly what this place is here for, for people to get together. Land centers kind of open up an opportunity for players who may feel a little bit more uncomfortable going out into the public where they would feel more comfortable interacting with others on their computers. It gives them that environment. It's such a community, regardless of, of who you are, where you are, which you come from, anything like that, it's, and, it's a community. Anyone can do it. Yeah. Like, like, don't tell yourself, oh, I'll never be that good. Like, it literally, it just takes time. Mm -hmm. There's also, there's a level of community engagement, and mm -hmm. I think we're gonna see this a lot in esports. Something you were saying about the fans getting into it, right. when you go to tournaments for video games, the players are walking around you in the convention yes. center there. Exactly. You can see them, you can hang out with them and shake their hand and yeah. talk to them. Exactly. exactly. And it wasn't until I joined the crew, my game went from like here, to here and I, I actually in 2010 I was ranked as highest number one in the world at one point and I was like it's only because of a crew. Alright, we've had enough talk. 
I want to see some games being played. All right. Gentlemen, jump into the game. Hey guys, it's Jeff. Welcome to the eSports community. The best part of this, you can come from any background and be a part of it. Gender, financial background, ethnicity, it doesn't matter. Everyone is on an equal playing field in this sort of way. There is a part of this community that can hide behind a screen and that needs to be curbed in eSports right now. The fact that you know you might meet people in person has definitely woken up the eSports world of, hey, you have a, a level of social responsibility whether you're behind a screen or in person. Follow that and do the right thing. From making money to building a supportive community, today we saw how different players and organizers have made it in the ever-growing world of esports. The esports world is only growing bigger in popularity. Get in on the action before it's too late and keep following along with Exploring Esports.